great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected, only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASECT certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. There's no one right way to design your relationship. And lots of people... Actually, about 25%, according to a recent national survey, are interested in some type of open relationship. But how do you know if you are ready to open up happily? Not everyone is, and that's no problem. I've got a 60-second quiz that will give you the answer. And even better, you'll walk away with your next step, whether you're good to go or not so much when it comes to opening up. And this is no BuzzFeed nonsense. I personally designed this quiz from my years of academic research. Go to joliquiz.com. That's J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z.com. And find out if you're ready to open up happily and what to do if you are or if you're not. Hi, welcome to season six of Project Relationship. I'm so excited to finally be recording, we have taken just a, a snippet of a break. And not a break from the podcast, not so much a break. <laughs> exactly. So we've been taking a little bit of a break from the podcast, just a month or so, because, well, we decided to renovate our house, or it maybe decided to renovate us. Yeah. Perhaps that's a better way to say it. You know, when you start a project in your life, in your love, in your home... It often turns into a bigger project than you initially thought it would. And has impacts on you you weren't expecting. Yeah. And the thing is, we say all the time, or I have said many times, a relationship is a system. And a system will respond to change. Our lives have very much been playing out that way. Yep. And how that has wound up working out is that we haven't had time to have the conversations, not just the recorded conversations that we share with you all, um, but we've also struggled to find time to have the conversations at the depth that we typically yeah, go to. Right. We've had to really elbow out some space to make room while we're doing this big project. Um, and, you know, I've been dating. I wasn't going to stop dating the people I'm seeing just to have a project. That's not treating people with humanity. I wouldn't do that, but um, wow. So here we are back recording. And I wanted to share why we've been away because when we were taking this um, little break, I realized that 
I have this amazing group of people who I'm connected to. I have a group of sexuality professionals, um, intimacy experts, um, physical and wellness professionals, and they're amazing. And I want to start sharing with you all some of their knowledge. So Ken and I are going to keep having the conversations we've been having with you and in front of you. (laughs) And um, we're going to keep answering your questions. And also, we've been recording some guest episodes. And so today we have a guest episode with someone who I was really glad to have talked to because um, Elizabeth Kristoff is just an amazing expert on how to regulate and co-regulate, how to train your nervous system. And Ken, you and I have talked about um, co-regulation and mm-hmm. self-regulation. Or on an, We actually did a whole episode on this. So we're not going to open up this episode with a whole repeat of what he and I have said before. But I think I would like to, like from, from right here, what has it been like to be, to be in our relationship? Which is, it's pretty functional, but we've had some rough spots. Really rough over spots. Over this last month. Yep. And when I say rough, for me, it's been um, times when my rage has surfaced, times when I have wanted to back away, which is not my go-to move really, but I have. Yeah. Um, times when each of us, it feels like, have lost our, our voice. Yeah, and I've... I've found myself acting in combination of entitled ways and um, falling back onto old avoidant patterns that I've been working on. And as our situation changed, yeah, disrupted me. And then I found myself doing things that didn't work relationally. Yeah. And I didn't realize that how how close to the edge we had been playing but in fact building this company and also you know you have a you have a, a job a career you enjoy and love um and we have a family <laughs> with children and three of them are all graduating from things right now so and what happened was we the don't stress live in level. our house anymore and now we don't live in our house we, have, we found out we needed to not just move out a part of it but the whole thing in order to do the renovation so there's, we no water. Are, there's no, there's no water. walls. So no electricity we're not there. that we can use. Yeah. And it's weird. So, yeah, what affects the home? The home's an extension yeah. of our being in many ways. And in Jungian psychology, like if you were to dream of your home, it, it's, your you, it's symbolically, right? it's you. Yeah, exactly. Remember that time that you had a dream that there helped you work through and he was so proud of you because you dreamed of a home. Yeah. You dr- and you yep. hadn't been. You'd been dreaming of being like in lost fields and in open spaces and you dreamed of being in a home that, that you really made to significant. Be yours. Yeah. Right. And I think that really that that speaks to what Elizabeth is going to talk to us yeah. about. And so I had the conversation with Elizabeth. Elizabeth and I have worked together before. In fact, um, we've worked together on jealousy. She and I created a jealousy workshop that is available. Um, you can purchase it right now um if you if you want to go to my website joliehamilton.com you can grab this great 97 dollar two-hour workshop that walks you through my cognitive jealousy framework and elizabeth's applied neurology for how to get your body to understand what's going on with your jealousy and how to soothe yourself so that you can apply the cognitive tools because you can't apply the cognitive tools Mm -hmm. right without the body being soothed so while while we're talking about <laughs> nervous system regulation, though, I'm noticing that even just sitting here with you talking, we haven't really prescribed this, but I'm going to go out on a limb. I don't prescribe much. Um, if you want to really dig into your relationship, just start a podcast with, you know, a partner yeah, or two or, or friend. It's been go very for it. useful. <laughs> it's really it's useful. Really well. and, and, you know, the, I think we could have done many projects together, but one of the ways you and I co-regulate is by touching. And something that I notice is when we are recording these, we start to overlap our bodies a little bit. And when we start recording these for video, which we're going to do in season seven, people will notice, like, right now I have my feet up on your lap. Um, And often we lean in and touch arms or we're holding hands. And I don't know that this is a significant detail, but usually when we start talking, we're not in that position. And the more we talk, the closer together we get. Right. Right. Thomas More said, conversation is the sex act of the soul. Right. Right? Yeah. We converse, and I feel a connection happening. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth's going to speak to this 
in the episode, but there is, there's something physiological going on when we start to align and synchronize with each other. And it's something really important that starts with when you're an infant and not all of us have really easy access to our ability to self-regulate and co-regulate. So I thought we'd, before, we're going to kick over to the interview in just a minute, but I just wanted to own that it's been really challenging for me to have fewer moments to access you yes. for co-regulation. Right. It's, a, it's something that I, I knew I leaned on, but I don't think I realized how much until we found ourselves with less time. And the shift of patterns and not doing the conversations like this on a repeated basis the way we were. And right. All of a but, sudden, yeah. But then we also have this opportunity right here. So we're currently sitting. Um, so I, my daughter rents a small place from us that I inherited when my father passed away. And we're sitting in her laundry room. It's like a six by six square foot area. And I could not actually be any more content. It's really, yeah. I actually want to savor this mm-hmm. moment. So I, I know we need to get to this interview because it's fantastic and you're all going to get something out of it. I know it. I'm really excited to share it. Elizabeth and I talked about co-regulation, self-regulation, jealousy, what happens when um, you don't even know exactly what you're feeling. Um, and we got into some of the messy stuff. And my favorite part about it was Elizabeth really approaches... Um, the body and the brain from an evidence-based perspective. So if you're someone who has struggled with some of the um, touchy or feelier aspects of how we do this, this relational individuation thing together, cool. This is a good one for you. Or if your partner or one of your partners feels that way, great. This is a great place to start. I would jump right in. And, um, Do you have anything else you'd like people to know about this before we start? Well, I just wanted to say that I don't know if you all noticed, but uh, Jolie just shared a secret about us with all of you. One of the reasons our podcasts are so long is that once we get into them, they are blissful. The, the the increase in intimacy that the two of us feel together is one of the reasons we're like, okay, there's no reason this shouldn't be 20 minutes. And 40 minutes later, we're done. Right. <laughs> and this is why. Because yeah. it's And it's so, so the hormonal response, the yeah. dopamine hit, the, the oxytocin hit, we're physiologically is. changed. Yeah. And that can be possible for all of us in different ways. We all have access to those responses in our body in different ways. So there's not one right way to do it. You don't have to start a podcast. Though so I will listen. You know, if you if you start a podcast because of this, please email me, Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. Yeah. We, we want to know it. about it. <laughs> okay. So now you're about to hear from Elizabeth Kristoff. Elizabeth is an expert in using applied neurology to move people out of pain, unwanted behaviors, and stress responses. She's the founder of Brain-Based Wellness, an online platform that trains the nervous system and body to resolve old patterns and improve performance and increase well-being. Elizabeth is a certified applied neurology practitioner. She's been in the movement and wellness industry since 2007. She works with entrepreneurs, athletes, leaders, and creatives to improve resilience, manage stress, and regulate emotions through intentional science-based brain training. Let's go. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for joining me on this, what is absolutely going to be, I already know, one of my favorite episodes of Project Relationship because this topic is so juicy and you bring, I think, my favorite voice in all of the somatic world. And I've been around the block, but you have something special here. So thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you so much. That really means a lot. And thank you so much for having me on the show. And I'm very excited to dive into this with you. Your perspective on this has really shaped how I see jealousy and, and inner interpersonal relationships. So I'm excited. Yeah. So yeah, rather than worry about where we've all been, both of us agreed that let's get right to the present and talk about jealousy and all the ways that we can help each other in our relationships actually regulate around jealousy, how we can help each other use it for what it's good for. Let's just talk about it from where we are today. 
Um, and I've done your introduction, but can I ask, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. It's been, you know, one of those up and down weeks, but luckily I, I do have tools to regulate my nervous system. And so I did some good nervous system regulation prior to getting on with you. And, um, and yeah, now I feel pretty good, pretty present, ready to rock and roll. That's it. It's about having the tools in the toolbox. And then I think my number one um, stumbling block is remembering to use them at those opportune moments. Like, right, I've been outfitting myself, but now I have to remember to actually put them into practice. And a moment like jealousy, when jealousy arrives, is exactly the time when I find people struggle to utilize their tools, to utilize their all the ways that they have made themselves competent, capable adults ready to deal with difficult situations. Jealousy is both overwhelming and totally benign and like every day. And that's the moment that'll take you right off your feet. Right. Yeah, it really is. And so the work that I do is I, I teach people really practical neural exercises to train their nervous system, their operating system so that they can handle more stress and not move into protective outputs. But I also use a lot of those tools for regulation in the moment of stress. What is something very tangible, very practical that can provide your brain and your nervous system with some stimulus that it needs to calm down, to move out of whatever emotional state has been triggered or the stress response, the threat that has been triggered and to come into a different state of being. And I'm really finding more and more exactly what you were talking about that. What we do on my site is we spend a lot of time like creating a daily practice of training the nervous system, just like you would train your muscles in the gym to get stronger, training the nervous system to be more resilient. And that is really important. But what I'm finding is almost more important is that people just keep collecting these tools, these neural exercises that they get really comfortable with. And pr the reason to practice them so much is so that in the moment of stress, in the moment of dysregulation, you have something that you know your nervous system responds positively to. And then the more you practice it, the more likely you are to turn to that in that moment, because at that moment of jealousy, which is very dysregulating, very threatening um, emotional landscape, it's, it's hard to remember oh, I need to do this simple thing and I can actually change how I'm feeling. I can change my lived experience and to not spiral down and get further and further dysregulated and, and move deeper into your threat response. And so it is really important to sprinkle these, these exercises throughout the day, practice them regularly, and then become, you become more confident using them in the times of, of actual stress. That's it. I, when we first talked about how you were teaching people to regulate their nervous systems and to, and to help them just stay in a, in a safe zone, right? I, I very much likened it to my days crossfitting when um, my partner would say, you can either hurt all the time or you can take a short period of each day and do some work so that you'll hurt less overall. And that's exactly what it reminds me of is, yep, it's that everyday training. And I don't think I fully appreciated how useful the neurological training and the, the simple things. I mean, I use just a few of the simple steps that you gave me. I use them all the time. And I didn't know that I was going to need them so much because I have all these psychological tools. Great. I have all these like, and when I, let me be, be clear, what I mean is I have all these thinking tools and I'm so well equipped and I'm guessing a lot of my listeners count, would count themselves in that same way. I speak about, and I act from thinking and my head so much, but if, if I didn't add some, some somatic tools and more specifically some tools dis designed to calm me, all the thinking in the world, all it was leading me to do was shut down a lot of the emotions and ignore them. A lot, I just shut down my responses and intellectualize my way out of them. And it was tricking me. And, and I say that with all the love in the world for my brain, it loves me and my, and it's great. So for all the thinkers out there, I think Elizabeth is the perfect gateway into, okay, what's below, what's below my neck? <laughs> what else is going on? Uh, 
I mean, I, I can really relate to that. Like I have intellectually bypassed my emotions for like most of my life and tried to override my instincts. Um, and, and it worked for a while until it didn't. Right. And then it starts to catch up with us. It starts to catch up in autoimmune. It starts to catch up in unwanted behaviors that we're using to regulate ourselves because we aren't taking the time to develop other tools to regulate our nervous system, like overeating or binge eating or self-harm or drinking or smoking or all the things that we do to self-soothe when we don't have other tools because we're not looking at it. And the, the thing is that, you know, our brains and our nervous systems are, they're wired for survival and safety first. And when we get triggered, you know, the, the thing that gets triggered, the trauma, or we don't even have to call it trauma. We could just say like an old pattern, an old Mm. adaptive coping response gets triggered. And it also comes with this whole cascade of emotions, which are really physiological events that occur in the body. There's chemicals associated with them. There's changes in, in your heart rate, changes in your respiration. And so when that stuff gets triggered, we move into a survival response. We move into trying to ensure safety for ourselves. And that is always going to be our brain's primary concern. So I can't cognitively override that response, even though I know better, even though I have all of these mindset tools. And I think mindset is really important. And I think, um, intellectually understanding our behavior is really important, but then we also need tools to be able to work with the body and the nervous system to bring it on board with the stuff that we know intellectually so that while I'm taking the new action or trying to implement the new mindset, my, my body and my operating system feel safe enough to let me do that. That's it. There's the trick. The if I'm not safe enough, then I can't use the cognitive framework. So my work in jealousy, I did not expect to find a cognitive framework. I wasn't setting out from that perspective because I'm not, I'm, I'm not a traditional therapist type. I wasn't trained that way. I was trained to look for depth. I was trained to look for unconscious motivations, but I did stumble on one and it's helpful. It's just simple, you know, notice jealousy, name jealousy, ner- navigate your boundaries, it, it's narrate, you know, check your story <laughs> and then nurture compersion. Nice and simple, really. And not one of them is possible if I'm already in full survival, but you're pointing to something that I think most people misunderstand about jealousy. Since we think about jealousy in romantic relationships, especially we think about it from the perspective of an adult, right? We're, we're having a romantic attached, yummy, you know, or, or sexual connection. And so we're thinking about how we're such a grown up, <laughs> but jealousy is a baby's response. Jealousy was put there for an infant to stay connected to their caregiver. So now I'm, I, I still, I see such alignment between our work because me helping people to name what's going on in their jealousy isn't going to happen if they are essentially cast back to being six months or 18 months old in their body and feeling a threat because they've either just been, it could be as simple. It doesn't have to be traumatic with great big air quotes around. It could be your mother needed to take a break and put you in your crib and you were upset about it. And that can be very real. And it might've been the best choice for her mental health. She could have been doing everything beautifully and this still gets wired in. So this is definitely not about blame and it's not about deciding that there's one perfect way to be parented. And if only that had happened, we would be magically whole and healthy and nothing would hurt. It's that jealousy is there to protect us from getting separated from someone we care about. So that's that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it's, again, it's not about blame. Like, uh, you know, parents are doing the best that we can. And myself, like I grew up with a single mom who was Mm -hmm. under a lot of stress and worked a lot. And, um, she absolutely did the best that she could given the circumstances that she was under. And I was left alone a lot. And also she was under a really high stress level. And so for me, when I needed too much, when I expressed too much emotion, when I I really needed that co-regulation and I was being vocal about it, it actually increased her stress level 
And her stress level was already so high that a lot of times she ended up moving into a dissociated state, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Checking out because it was just too much stress. That's what our body does when we're under too much stress for too long. But as a child, that feels like abandonment, right? Right. Because as children, we are co-regulating all of the time. And so my experience and development was a lot of the felt sense of abandonment and a real scarcity of attachment. Right. And so we, my, my survival brain starts to feel very threatened very quickly when I start to feel that same scarcity of attachment, when I feel, because it operates under that old pattern of that there's not enough and that it's going to go away at any time. Right. And so when I start to feel that in, in new relationships, whether that's a friendship or in an intimate partnership, it triggers that same survival response of my, my survival need for attachment, for connection, for attention, for care is being threatened. And then that starts the whole physiological response of, of moving me into threat and ending up in either, you know, fight, flight, freeze, or, or fawn and all the emotions that come with that. Yeah. Okay. So let's define two terms for people before we move on. First, I'll just define for the purposes of this, we're talking about jealousy being a problem of threes. Jealousy is about fearing that our connection to a beloved other would be interrupted or broken somehow. So it's different from envy because envy would be, I want what you have. Envy is a feeling of longing and Jealousy is a feeling of fear that will have that connection interrupted. And Elizabeth, would you define co-regulation? Because I think we, we hear that it's kind of buzzy right now, but would you define it for us? Yeah. So co-regulation is basically just as human beings, we evolved to, it's not just that we communicate with our words, our nervous systems are always communicating with each other. And so our our heart rhythms will sync up. We, we feel inside of ourself, the stress of, of people around us or the, mm-hmm. the calm of people around us. And our nervous system responds to that, especially when we're in an intimate, close relationship with the person. And most, especially in, in childhood, if the person is our caregiver. So, you know, we are, Uh, our nervous systems are constantly changing. Our brain and our nervous system is very plastic and it's always responding to the stimulus around us. And one of the main pieces of stimuli is actually this, the, the neurobiological signals coming from the people around us. And we feel that inside of our own body and we respond to it. And so we are regulating our nervous system to what we're experiencing with the people around us. This makes tons of sense. Thank you for being so clear because I am now having this image. So I have seven kids. And if there's one thing having a bunch of kids will teach you is that you can give the same, you know, the same set of children, what you think are the same experiences, but all of the, the little minuscule differences in their neurology, in, in how they're wired, in the way they take things in, it all winds up come coming together to create very individual experiences of what it is to be in connection to each of us. So I have, you know, even a set of twins who just, yep, they, I can feel how they respond to my words and my being in these very different ways. And that's completely normal. So one of them might go more into fight and the other into freeze at the same stimulus or ostensibly the same stimulus, it's still like, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm asking them to do a chore together and they might both go into an activation state, but completely looks different. And I think that's one of the reasons as (laughs) grownups, we get confused because it feels like other people should respond the way we expect them to but they're going to have their own response. They're going to have been synced up to us or dysregulated from us with their own particular way of being. And that's normal. There's like a, such a huge range. 
Yeah, we all have our own unique neuro matrix, which is made of our past experience and even, you know, physical deficits in our nervous system. So, you know, I might have a visual issue with my right eye or a balance issue in my left ear or a body mapping issue from an old injury. And all of these little, these are what give our nervous system information coming in. We call those inputs. Mm -hmm. And so we all have different deficits in our input systems. And then that's the information that our brain takes in and uses to make predictions to recognize patterns and to generate an output. And, and that information coming in really determines whether we go into a protective output or performance output where we can be connected and present. So we all have our own unique neural matrix and, and also too, our brains find certain tool, certain responses that get it to get the regulation or the safety that it needs. And it finds whatever's going to work best for us. So for me, for instance, like I started binge eating at a really early age. That was one of the best ways that my brain found to get me to reduce my interaction with the world, to get a lot of stimulus to my vagus nerve and my insular cortex and some important areas of the brain that are needed for interception and to bring me into my parasympathetic, my calm and respond, rest and digest part of my nervous system and to move me out of a state of high stress. And also to get me to just kind of reduce the amount of interaction coming in with the world, because I was under too much stress for too long, but for somebody else that might not work. And so their brain finds a different output that is almost like a behavior change tool of the old brain of the survival brain to get them to reduce the amount of stimulus coming in and stay safe. So for some people, it might be pain for other people. It might be a migraine for other people. It might be the need to like run and physically move. And so there's all these different outputs that our brain produces to keep us safe. And then there was another really important point there too, is that, you know, our, our kids are really responsive to our nervous system. And I was just speaking with a client that has been working a lot on regulating her nervous system. And she was like, oh my God, my daughter is so different. Like it's so different to be around her. And it really solidified for me that one of the best things we can do for people that we're in relationship with and for our children, especially and I'm not a parent, so I can't speak to this exactly, but is, is to regulate our own nervous system. And I have clients that ask me all the time for tools that they can give to their kids. And increasingly I'm, I think, well, that's great. You can give your kids some neural exercises, but really the best thing you could do is implement these neural exercises for yourself so that you are creating um, a safe regulated nervous system and a safe regulated container for them. And you can hold their emotions and their reactions without becoming dysregulated yourself so that they feel safe to do that. And, and that will help their nervous system more than any exercise I give you for them could. This is ringing so true. Like, I feel like my whole heart is just <laughs> pulsating with the the reality of this. So I, I, because there's a very clear line for me before I was able to self-regulate before I found not just tools, but I found practices of co-regulation in my adult um, most attached relationship before we found safety together, I spent, it turned out my whole life before that in threat. And I didn't realize it because I kept going. I went from my father's house to my first husband's house into my first polyamorous relationship. And all of them were incredibly dangerous situations. And so, and then I had my babies young. So they lived through all of that. And what it meant was that as my, now I have these older children who are able to see how I can parent. So they're adults now and they can watch how I parent their younger siblings. And they're like, why couldn't, why couldn't you do that for me? And there's been a lot of apologizing for, right. And, and holding space for and regulating myself so I can take that in and help Mm -hmm. them understand that it, it wasn't their fault. I, and, and yes, I was doing quote unquote, the best I could at the time. And it wasn't good enough. It wasn't, they deserved better. I deserved better. And now I can so clearly see the difference that I have the proof. I have the lived proof of exactly what you were saying. It's not, I kept trying to find solutions for my kids. I was a very proactive mother. Oh, this child is anxious and this child, and I'm finding them therapists and activities and, you know, equestrian and like all these things. And the number one thing that changed everything was I learned how to regulate. I went back to school and specialized in something that opened my 
myself, all my whole self, my big capital S self to calming the mm. fuck down, <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to yeah. calming down. And then they could. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's true. It's like, we, we all do deserve better. Right. And we just don't know, like so many of us are just not taught the tools. We're not taught about our operating system, which is our nervous system, which is how we experience the world. And, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to change relationship patterns if you're living in that survival state in that high stress state. And I've, I've had very much the same experience of keeping finding myself in very turbulent, very volatile relationships. I, you know, I also have a lot of childhood trauma, high A score, all of that stuff. And for, you know, I got sober when I was 24, I learned a lot of mindfulness practices. I would meditate a lot. And there were things that I just caught, could not move myself out of cognitively or with my intellect. And it, that was my binge eating and it was my relationship patterns. And it just played out over and over again. And in fact, would get more and more magnified until I learned tools to to change that at the level of my nervous system and in my body so that I, I could be different in the relationship. And then the patterns would start to, to play out differently. And even now in my life, like I am, I am in partnership now, and it is a very different kind of relationship. It's a very safe, secure container for me to explore intimacy. And now in this safe, secure container, all these new things are coming up that I'm seeing that I'm like, Oh God, like, you know, I could never get to even this level because I was in so much turbulence before. And I have these nervous system tools, but it's still, it's a whole nother level of healing and working with my nervous system and my subconscious. That's it. Okay. So this, that gets us to a great place because I think people who are listening to this podcast tend to be people who they've, um, they've up-leveled their relationships in some ways, you know, they've really, they've done some achieving when it comes to relating, Mm -hmm. like they, they, they're starting to make conscious agreements and they've found ways to securely connect, or they're off on the adventure of non-monogamy and, and, and using the massive number of tools that there are in that ways that you can think about relationships that can help you, um, really ground into being in relation to yourself first but we rarely talk about what that opens you up to, which is, um, as I think Ken puts it as like a mess, a giant mess, you know, you, you can feel like you're okay. And then you think, great. I found this awesome spot in my relationship. We are such, we are in such a good place that now I'm a mess. And the answer is yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a new mess though. And it's good, but I don't think people expect it. (laughs) Yes. I, I didn't, I really didn't, you know, I was like, Oh my God, here we are doing this conscious partnership. And as the, as I've opened myself to a level of intimacy and vulnerability and connection that was never possible before it is leading me back to, to deeper wounds that I see that I I would not have been able to see before. And because they're deeper and the connection is so strong, it, it can feel very, very scary and life-threatening to dive into them. And, you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of work recently with my clients on boundaries and particularly on fawn response. And so I was doing a lot of research on fawn response, which is basically when we go into people pleasing or over agreeing, or even sometimes mirroring, activating Mm -hmm. mirror neurons by like repeating someone's speech or mannerisms as a way to make greater connection with them. And so it is a, it's a trauma response to ensure our social connection and to ensure co-regulation. And it is reflexive. It's a reflexive trauma response when our body goes into social engagement to appease or mollify people around us and ensure that we get that connection and safety. And so it can happen like when we're getting close to expressing our truth or our opinion, because that feels like we might come into conflict and and lose safety. It can um, happen when we have to express our desires because maybe we weren't taught that it was okay to ask for what we needed, that we might be punished or abandoned or neglected. And it can come from, from all kinds of things that we learn in our development. We had a sick parent a lot. And so, you know, if we need too much or express emotions, or like I was talking about with my mom being stressed, I don't want to add more stress. And then we go into this placating response, but I was really thinking about that in terms of jealousy and your definition of jealousy is the trauma bond or as the love bond being threatened, the connection being threatened. And 
how it's the same thing when we have that loop of when this bond is threatened, when my connection is threatened, my survival is at stake. My life is at stake. And jealousy then is a real survival response to that feeling of not having the attention, care, and and co-regulation, healthy co-regulation that we needed as a child. Right. And now you're reminding me that one of the things I see frequently with jealousy is um, two people, they're in an experience and one of them just cannot understand why is my partner jealous? Like they just, they, they cannot understand why given the circumstances, it just doesn't logic out for them. Like they're, they're very much, the math doesn't check out. Like I haven't done anything. There's nothing to feel threatened about, right? There's no, and the number of times this comes up is certainly more than once a day with clients. For me, one partner is feeling like I'm doing all the things right. We're connected. We are. And the other is in a threatened feeling state because it really doesn't have anything to do with an objective reality. And so that then further presses that, you know, like it, it wedges them apart because now one of them is feeling like, it's all very irrational and that can send them into their own response. But even if they can hold space and they hold on and they're like, okay, I know this doesn't make any sense. And they're trying to hold on unless they can somehow be patient for a long enough to, for the, for the other person to calm down and come into relation again, it almost always winds up pushing them further and further apart. So they just wind up with having essentially two separate relationships that like, they bear almost no um, correlation to each other. There's no reality check available. It's, yeah. and I think jealousy in particular, because people want to make it about facts. Jealousy is about like, well, is he calling other people? Is she texting behind your back? Is like, they want to make it about what are the actions, but I'm hearing you talk about a very real response that would be so subtle. And happening at such a, a minute level, such a, such a, like a teensy tiny little, little indicator of threat. So yeah. I'm thinking like a change in the tone of voice or setting down a grocery bag too heavily or walking with your footsteps, like in a different cadence, those kind of things can set a partner off. And now we're already out of sync with each other. And when it's, when it wakes up that jealousy fear, we're talking like just instantly can go to threat and confusion because, but there's nothing to be jealous about. Do you have, what what would you say about that? Absolutely. Because especially when we come from um, trauma in our childhood, and again, it could be perceived neglect. It could be perceived abandonment. It doesn't have to be actual. And it can be, you know, a, a series of smaller instances over time. Or like I had a client who felt like their sibling was always favored and they were kind of left out of that, um, connection and that, you know, wasn't anything huge, but it was a, a lifetime of developing, feeling like you were left out of the herd. You weren't as, as secure. Right. And so we can become really hyper vigilant about reading people's expressions, reading sounds. We, we get stuck in this high stress state where we are overly attuned almost to other people's facial expressions, tone of voice reactions. And then it, it can just take these tiny little things to set that whole cascade of emotions. Because when the jealousy gets triggered, when the threat response gets triggered, it can push us into an emotional flashback, experiencing the chemical emotional state that we experienced at that age, the, the felt sense of abandonment, the felt sense of neglect, the felt hopelessness. And, and, and that can, really color our whole external world. And we see things very differently from how they are. And then just like what you were saying, without anything to interrupt the loop, it, it, the, the two people can end up really spiraling into a pattern that drives them apart. Because for me, for instance, and this is the same for a lot of my clients, when we start to feel that threat response, you will go into a a threat reaction, right? It could be fight. You could get really aggressive. It could be fawn. You could start over people pleasing and negating your own boundaries and, um, 
And I tend to go into flight. I want to get the hell away as fast as I can because it doesn't feel safe. And so I, I push this distance between myself and the person, which is, again, it's subtle at first, but then they react to that, yeah. right? And then I react to their reaction. And before we know it, that void is, is really big. And so it takes either someone who's very well regulated, who can hold the space for the person experiencing the jealousy and understand this is not personal. This is not about me. This is a instinctual threat response. And they just need to have the space to process through it because I know that I, you know, there's no reason not to trust me and I'm just going to hold this container or it takes both people having tools to interrupt the cycle, to experience the response and say, okay, I need some regulation right now. What can I do to bring myself back to safety? Um, What can you do to bring yourself back to safety so that we can feel inside of ourselves a felt sense of safety and presence. And now we can react differently. Now we can get out of survival mode and we can have a conversation about what happened without it being colored by all these emotions that distort reality. Right. Right. Okay. I want to say something. I don't know whether I've ever mentioned on the podcast, but this is a moment that can be weaponized. That moment when one person is maybe having a micro moment of disengagement that then winds up turning into one on the other side and back and forth, right? We're playing like this really ugly tennis game and we wind up really far apart and whacking at each other from really far distances. But the there is a spot in here. Let me show, see if I can paint the picture. There's a, there's a moment when someone can say to their partner, I see that you're dysregulated. And now we've got, now we got a game because that is not coming from a place of caring. And some of it has to do with tone and what the previous Mm. use of that language is, but there can be a real blame and shaming that happens Mm. with like, oh, see, you're being irrational. You're dysregulated. I'll talk to you when you're able to, or just a certain, um, putting themselves on a pedestal an aggrandizement, right? I'm, I rise above this. So if, in particular, I see people who happen to be low jealousy reactors or people who are with people who tend to fawn and, and, and be anxious, right? So they don't have as many um, inputs around jealousy. Like it just doesn't come up, right? So they, they're very privileged to not have that experience. They feel very well regulated and then they can Absolutely. And I have seen this happen. They sometimes they turn it around on their partner and forget that it's not personal on both sides. It's not personal. It's not about whether you're better at or worse at this. It's about relating. It's because this is a a moment where I see people start to act like, well, when they get their jealousy under control and it, it's, Mm -hmm. it, it just drives them further apart, but it also becomes, it's a really unattractive quality in someone. To, to watch them do that to their partner and, yeah, and talk and like as if they're too evolved for jealousy. Cause sorry. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I think that's so important because shame is such a huge part of that inner critic complex PTSD um, emotional flashback landscape that it, it, already as someone is experiencing that they're going to be bombarded with their own inner critic and their own shame. And if they feel that coming from their partner too, that they are crazy or dysregulated or overly emotional, that that is, that's, that's, that's terrible. It's It's a terrible place to go. And there's no coming back from that really, you know, and like, um, that is, that's not holding a safe container for each other, right? Like it's okay to experience jealousy. It's okay to get stuck in the loop. Sometimes it's okay. We all do it. And like, that is, that's really important to understand. And it's something that I really value in my partnership now is, you know, my, my person has actually in a moment of my dysregulation, sat me down and held my hand and said, it's okay that you're in the loop. It's okay to be in the loop. You don't have to get out of it right now. It's okay. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Ken and I use a, um, there's something we do. We have in our house that helps a lot. We each have a picture of each other when we're very little. Like I have a picture of him when he's four. He has one of me when I was five. 
And when we notice that our, that each of us is going into that spot, um, a glance at that picture is such a good reminder that our person is also this little person who doesn't know how to get out and it's okay. And it just opens up so much compassion. It's, it's just such a good tool for me personally. I need something to, to help me because, because I, it would be so easy for me to join them in particular in jealousy, easy for me to join my partner and just spiral out of control. And before you know it. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful concept. I I love that so much. And part of what helps me to get out of my own cycles is to also remember myself as that little kid and be like, it's okay. I know you feel this, like I got you. And like, we're going to do some stuff. And like, there's nothing wrong with you for feeling this way for a long time it was really scary. And you didn't get your needs met. And now we're going to, I promise we're going to keep creating a safe place for you. And I think that remembering that about your partner too, is, is like, what a beautiful way to, to be with each other. Yeah. And so, because we're, we're non-monogamous that we are, we open ourselves to jealousy. Like we're, we intentionally invited in through the front door, you know, that, that is sort of what it's possible at any moment. Right. And so that practice started when we were both feeling triggered regularly enough that it was, it was easy to see how a bad couple of weeks could have led to a split. A bad couple of weeks might've led to us rather than using our non-monogamy as a, as a, a joy in our life. We might've wound up really far apart and imagining that that distance between us, which was actually designed as a threat response to keep us closer together, right? That we could absolutely wind up because we're adults making choices that would have left us splitting and not being together. And that that's where I think the, the work around jealousy is such patience, such patience with ourselves and patience with the other and patience with the fact that jealousy is not trying to hurt you itself. Je- like the jealousy isn't, we, you know, we call it the green eyed monster, but I picture it kind of like a monster, kind of like Toothless, the dragon in How I How, how to Train Your Dragon. Like, yeah, uh, a, a monster, but re- basically a, just a big kitten. Like, yeah. doesn't want to yeah. hurt you. It's trying to it, help. None of these things want to hurt us, right? Like from the perspective of applied neurology, all of our behaviors are our brain's best bet to either get the stimulus that it needs to stay healthy or to get the stimulus that it needs to stay regulated. And so- I, everything is a protective output. Everything is for your survival. So Mm -hmm. the jealousy is for your survival. The binge eating is for your survival. The, um, the compulsions are for your survival. Right. And so it's just a matter of understanding what it is that learning new tools to give our brain and our system what it needs so that we don't have to move out of those behaviors. And I think it's a really beautiful example that you guys learned these tools to be able to expand into the life that you want, into the type of relationship that you want. And I think that's, that's really essentially why I do all of this with people is train your nervous system, learn tools to work with your nervous system so that you can expand into the life that you want. You can grow your business the way you want. You can be in a relationship that reflects what your true desires are. You can be visible in the world. You can express your opinion. You can, whatever it is that you want to do so that you can do these things without pushing yourself continuously into threat and pushing yourself into unwanted outputs and experiencing pain and migraine and shutdown from trying to create the life that you want. Yeah. You're, you're naming something. I forget about how protective my migraines have been and I still get Mm -hmm. them. And I know I have some hormonal reasons that they come up, but, um, I remember being a kid and realizing that my mother's migraines were to protect her. She always got one if there was a family gathering and she was, she was always under threat. She was under actual threat during those times. So of course she did. And then I learned it from her and Mm -hmm it's, it's really nothing short of a miracle that a body could create that level of input. Cause it's very real. It's happening. It's, it's not being made up. Like the body is such a, a, an amazing vehicle of transformation that it will just turn that feeling into a very real physiological state. And now yeah, you're dealing absolutely. with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
chronic stress. So we're, we're meant to handle a little bit of stress. We need it for adaptation and we're supposed to be able to modulate between states of our nervous system, sympathetic, which is our arousal response. It's what prepares us to take action, to fight, to flee, to, to mobilize ourselves in the world. And then there's parasympathetic, which is calm and respond, rest and digest. That's when we get sleep, we repair our muscles, we digest food, and and we're supposed to move between those states. But when we get stuck in a too much sympathetic nervous system, too much stress response, too much threat for too long, that's when stress becomes chronic. And our nervous system and our our old brain, our survival brain have a deep intelligence that understands too much stress for too long. is dangerous. It will lead to disease. It will dysregulate the nervous system, lead to inflammation, autoimmune, um, a suppressed immune system that prepares your body for disease like cancer. Um, it can lead to mental health collapse. And so our, our system will produce an output to get us out of that state of chronic stress because it has to, it needs to get us out of that stress. So if we're staying in an elevated stress level for too long, yeah, a migraine is a great way to reduce the amount of stimulus coming in. You may go lay down in bed, turn off the lights, pull the covers over your head. There's no visual stimulus coming in. There's, there's no interaction with people, no other nervous systems to regulate around, no trauma being triggered. And for that that moment, your, your brain perceives you as safe. Pain is another great way to do that. If I'm in pain, I'm going to take smaller steps. I'm going to work out with less intensity. I'm going to interact with the world less. And, and in that moment, that is what my brain perceives as safe because I've been under too much stress for too long. Right. Right. Okay. So all that said, what do we do? What are the practical, like, I guess two prongs, because one, we want to learn to like get, get ourselves, get our toolkit set up so that we have some self-regulation, some ability to do this. But I'm wondering if before we go there, could you describe some healthy co-regulation behaviors, like what it might look like in action? Because I know it's different for everyone. It's not like all bodies are exactly the same or all partnerships are the same. So what are some examples knowing that this is a very individual thing and people should find what works for them. Yeah. I, I really think that that's kind of the most important thing is to understand that everyone's really different because you can read like blanket things like, you know, a a 10 second hug will help you co-regulate or like, um, you know, taking long breaths together or, um, you know, moving in sync together is a great way to co-regulate. And all of that is true and great. Um, eye contact, right. Is another great way, um, to co-regulate, but everybody's really different. And for some people, some of that might be threatening they might have a minimum effective dose of like too much touch is, is not good. That's that there's the wrong moment at the wrong moment. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's really, I think important first and foremost to under start to develop an understanding of your own nervous system. What do your threat signals look like? Right. What do you start to experience a little bit of pain? Do you start to feel a migraine coming on? Does your jaw get tight? Do your palms get sweaty? Does your respiration move into your upper chest? And can you start to notice when those signals are occurring in your life and say, okay, I'm moving into stress response. Something about this situation is stressing me out and then start to find practices, tools, whether it's neural exercises or just things like jumping on a trampoline, putting your feet out in the grass, taking a hot bath, like what does your nervous system respond positively to and how can I start to do that? And then in relationship, what does my nervous system respond positively to? And can it, is it the same for my partner? And can we start to work that into our yeah. relationship, knowing that it's, it's really individual. So the best thing to do is, is learn about your own nervous system. The best thing that I can do for my clients is teach them to be the expert of their own nervous system and how to assess and reassess how things are affecting their nervous system. And then what to do to change it. If it's negatively affecting you, how can you reduce the intensity or increase the stimulus to give your nervous system a positive response. Yeah. I, so I love this. It is the first step of my cognitive framework is this one, because you can't, you can't actually do anything about the cognitive piece unless you go to the body, turn to the body and say, what's the first clue. 
Because if I can't get there, then I'm already going to have spiraled off into a story about what the jealousy means or about what's happening, right? And now I am way down the path. So first I have to learn to notice, but what I find is there is a, there is a, a segment of my clients who struggle to name any sensations in their body. So when I ask them how, well, if I say, when you're jealous, what do you, what do you experience in your body? And they start to say things like angry or sad. I'm like, cool. What's the sensation you experience? And they say anxious and upset. And I say, yeah. And so if you were to really get in touch with your actual body, put your hands on your body right now. And I ask them, do you feel any heat or weight or pressure or tingling or anything in your body? And sometimes we can go like that for weeks, talking through that before they identify a signal in their body that's related to jealousy. And I think this is where I would say, if you struggle with this, like go to Elizabeth's work, look at getting to be your own expert on your own body's nervous system, because what I recommend to people is start looking at easier emotions. Jealousy is tough. Often yeah, people come to absolutely. me because they want to start working with jealousy. And I'm like, great. Can yeah, you identify the, the sensations frontier. of joy? <laughs> Cause they, yeah. Yeah. Cause a lot of times they can't, like they can't identify the sensations of joy. And I, I say that laughing because I couldn't either. I had Same. no idea what those sensations Same. were. And it used to make me yeah. mad when people would ask. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of times if you've lived your life in a pretty dissociated state, like you left your body over and over again, it, it can feel very threatening yeah. actually to drop into your body and try to feel the signal. So you've stayed out of it and then it, it becomes almost impossible to. And then there's another thing that happens with trauma over time or stress over time. We can just call it stress. Doesn't have to be big T trauma is that our vagus nerve can get damaged. And that's a really important nerve that kind of gives your brain the information about what's going on inside of you. It's a skill called interception and it tells your brain like, this is how fast my heart is beating. This is what's happening in my organs. This is what's happening with my digestion. And it gives your, it gives you the felt sense, um, inside of your body. But if that nerve isn't functioning great, your brain's not getting that information. So there's some really practical tools that you can use to start to stimulate your vagus nerve. And we do a lot of that on the site. Nice. And then there's also just this idea of like really minimum effective dose of everything. So can you drop into your body for just like 10 seconds and starting with something that's a little bit easier to feel than an emotion. Like when you breathe out and in, can you feel your ribs expand and contract? Mm. Can you feel your breath? Can you feel the soles of your feet on the floor? Can you feel, can you rub your hands together and feel the energy of your hands and the space they take up and just practicing these really, um, small and, and simple sensations without even attaching them to an emotion and keeping that time really limited so that you're not moving yourself into threat response. And then little by little, as you continue to use tools to regulate your nervous system and increasing that amount of time, kind of like exposure therapy that you're in your body, increasing the sensations that you can feel, then it starts to become safe to feel in your body. Then you start to actually train that skill of interception. And then you can start to try to feel emotions, but start with just really basic sensations of the body. I love that. And it's actually reminding me of one of the joys of being in, in an intimate relationship with someone is, um, so I wasn't in my body at all. And Ken was very much in his body. He's always had a better um, experience of being in his body and an ability to connect to sensation. And so at the beginning, when I was trying to learn this, um, I would, I would lie down next to him and, and just like sort of practice being in my body like him. Like I would just sort of mimic him. Like, what does it, mm. like, what does his posture look like? Roll my shoulders back and or just mimic a good example. And that's exactly what I see when I'm in, when I'm in connection with you, I'm like, oh yeah. Like my, I feel my shoulders go down. Cause I can, I can witness you relaxing. Mm. I can witness you releasing your jaw. And that, that helps me remember what it might feel like in my body to actually mm. relax. And I, that's I awesome. need yeah, I need co-regulation for that. I'm wondering what you would say to somebody who is, their relationship is strained and they are looking for tools 
and they've tried all the therapy and they've tried all the things like that they're supposed to do the list, would you say that their first step is to go to the nervous system? Is it like, is that it? I would definitely say that's a great idea to try, you know, and that it certainly has been what has helped me and to start at a very practical level with just, you don't have to tackle the big things yet. You don't have to change the relationship. You don't have to change the unwanted behavior. Just start to create a few minutes of safety for yourself Mm -hmm. every day. So there's like a saying in applied neurology, the brain just needs one good rep um, in order for something to be possible, one pain free rep. So like if I was trying to get someone to do a movement, I would find drills that allowed them to do that movement pain free. And then our brain learns that it's possible. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we create that sense of safety, just once, then our brain starts to understand what safety feels like. And then we start to learn the tools to create that safety. And then it can trickle out into our relationships. But I would say, start at like the really practical physical level of just working with the nervous system and seeing if you can do that and then see how your life just naturally changes from there. Right. So what I'm hearing is that if somebody's struggling with jealousy, or someone is struggling with an understanding that they just, their relationship doesn't work the way they want it to, even though on paper it should, but it just doesn't feel right that, that there's another thing to try. And the reason this matters to me is I know that people seek out my work because they want this what looks like essentially like magic level relating, right? People look at my own relationship that I have worked very hard to pull out of the depths of despair um, and into a good place, but they look at it and they're like, I want that. And the thing is you can't have it. You can only have your version of that magic. And in order to get there, you're going to have to go through your own body and your own story And so jealousy, while a great thing to work on, like as a symptom, when somebody comes and says, I have jealousy is an issue. I love that you are inviting us to dial it back to something simple and something that no matter where it shows up, even if like the, the outside impact of jealousy were to just magically go away, this work would still matter. This would be with you forever. This would impact how you raise your children, how you show up at work. It has certainly changed how I show up in business many times yeah. over. <laughs> so this is It'll this is work that every we'll, area, right? Right. So there's just it's yeah. a it's a win win situation. So Elizabeth, mm. I'd like to give you a chance to just like fill in what didn't get said, what should have been said today that you would like to leave the audience with. Well, I think what you were just talking about is actually a a really important point. And that is that I have my clients look at all of these things as, as symptoms of dysregulation, right? Like my binge eating is the binge eating is not the problem. I don't need to learn more about nutrition. We all know how many calories is quote unquote recommended, whatever. And, um, you know, we all know the behaviors that we want to have in our life. And it's, these things are just symptoms of dysregulation and, and unprocessed emotions, unhealed patterns in the body. And it is possible to reach train those patterns. So the jealousy, the, all the stuff, right. It's, it's possible to retrain the patterns. It can feel so frustrating and so painful when you keep getting stuck in the same loop. And there is just like you were saying, there's, there's another, there's another way to go about it. There's another way to try. And that's from the bottom up, from the body up and at the level of the nervous system. And as those things become resolved, it changes our experience of the world. It changes our behavior. And it's a new foundation of our operating system to, to try to bring about these changes. And so if you're stuck in any of those places, maybe give this a try because it can be, um, it can be an unexplored Avenue that can lead people to a lot of relief sometimes. Yeah. There's, that's the thing. When I see people, they're so frequently, they've exhausted their, what they've got for ideas starting within themselves, right? They've, they've exhausted that they're looking outward for resources, but the other thing that they're often doing especially when jealousy is on the table and listen up. I know some of my listeners specifically have written to me asking about this. 
they've moved into blaming their partner and their partner has is out of ways to control their own behavior. Like they have already tied everything down, opened their mm-hmm. phone to their partner. Like they've done everything. They have given mm-hmm. all the ground they can. They've already sacrificed some of their autonomy and it's still not working because mm-hmm. the call's coming from within the house mm-hmm. and we got to deal with that too. So this is, it is, it's an invitation. I, I'm so glad to have had you here because there are people who want to work with me, who I really think would, it would be wonderful if they worked with you. And we did, we actually did a jealousy workshop specifically, and it's out there. People can go to get the jealousy rewired workshop if you specifically want to work on that. But I think even more importantly, that daily practice that you offer on your site, showing up for people day after day, um, would you tell people how they can find you and how they can take this step if it's right for them? Yeah, I think this work goes really well together. Um, and I have a I have a membership site. It's called brainbased-wellness.com. And we train the nervous system live three times a week. We do applied neurology. We do somatic movement. We do um, all kinds of things um, to help resolve old patterns, to change to change behavior, to process emotions. And we do it together. We do it in community. And the best place to get started is to just go to the website and um, you can sign up for a free video series there that will start to teach you how to be the expert of your own nervous system. That'll give you some simple exercises to try, see how it feels in your body. And then if you're interested, come join us. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, easy, practical way that actually doesn't take that much time to create real change. Yeah. There's the thing, real change and the key there in community too, which when we're talking about relationships and wanting this to work better in our relationships, having a community of people who are actively supporting each other is a great model then for our nervous system to get used to. Like people can be safe. I can be supported it's, it really, I think it couldn't be more synergistic. So I'm grateful for you that you exist, that brain-based wellness exists. Thank you for existing in the world this way and for putting this work into the world. And thank you for coming and sharing all of this with us. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for having me and for your work. And I'm just really thrilled to, to be a part of it and have this conversation. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listen to Jolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J O L I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk aboutable sex, love, losses, and learns. Everything is talk aboutable. <laughs> She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember relationships can be messy and that's good news.